afternoon and welcome back to Unlocking the Power of You. I am Timothy White Sr. And today we're going to have a little bit of a different program. But before we get started with the program, the podcast, I need to say thank you to a few people. One of which is, is Reggie with Trier Brothers Tailoring at 5266 Warnsville Road. Go down there and check out Reggie's clothing. He has hats, shoes, sh- shirts, suits dresses he can accommodate pretty much everybody and that's reggie's trial brothers taylor in 5266 warnsville road also there's john taylor john taylor is over at fairhill 12200 fairhill road or lochmere road and he is in there cutting hair but as he's cutting hair he's also promoting us and what we're doing here today so go in there check him out get a haircut and also Purchase a book. And speaking of books today, we're going to be talking about books. But before we talk about the books again, there's one young lady that we said we want to say thank you to as well. And that's Cynthia Lewis. You recall have seen her a couple of weeks ago on the podcast with us. An amazing story, her life story, the things that she has endured and, and went through and how God blessed her to come through it all. And with that, she she has been a marketeer for us on the last few days. If you go to her Facebook page, that's Cynthia Lewis, you will see some amazing things there. And she has been promoting the books that we're going to be talking about, some of the books we'll be talking about today. Cynthia Lewis, an amazing young lady, somebody who loves the Lord, and she's helping us in what we're doing. And with that, we want to talk about the books today. But as you see, if you look here, we don't have any guests today because... It's me and Mr. Art Finley. Some of you, you've seen his face before. You heard his voice before. He's a military man. He was an army uh, He was in, and went to Vietnam, but he's here. And he's also my marketing director, sales and marketing director for the Tim White Publishing Company, which is also where all these books have come through. So with that, I want to introduce Art to some people because it may be your first time watching this podcast. We want you to know who he is, a little bit about him, and then we're going to jump right into talking about some of the books. Mr. Finley. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure being here, and we're going to have an opportunity to uh, share the number of 20 books, 20-plus books, on Amazon.com. And we've been talking about these books over the last several months Mm -hmm. uh, in different areas, starting off with, as I can remember, of victim of bullies. Mm -hmm. And that was a great topic. I had an opportunity to share the stage with Dr. Julius Averhart. Uh, They tagged me as the bully, and he was the good guy. No, we didn't tag you as a bully. You said you were a bully. No. (laughs) (laughs) Never. (laughs) You won't admit it, huh? Yeah. No, it's the difference between being aggressive and a bully. And you were? Aggressive. A bully. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we got that straight. <laughs> yeah. So we can move right along in it. Uh, with some of the books there, we want to share with the audience here um, from Tim White Publishing Company. There are four areas that we want to talk about as far as the listing of the different books. Uh, we talk about the books to, is number one, to inform. And I'm going to give you the books that we just are showing that are informing to you. And that's In the Ring with Heels On, She's the Boss, Choosing a Mate Over a Child, and Nothing But the Dog in Me. Uh, with that last one, I'd like to Tim. Tim, what was, your, what was your idea in writing that, Nothing But the Dog in Me? What did you want to expose? <laughs> what did I want to expose? You know what? As, uh, as I was thinking through the books that have already, we already have, it came to me and we will elaborate a little bit more shortly on the books that preceded that. That is in a series of books we have. That one is, I can't say that's even the final book in the series right now, but it's the book that I was told to write because we have an issue with men, men who are dominant, men who like to be controlling, but then we have to balance that out. Well, why do these men want to be controlling? What are they trying to control? They're trying to control women. 
Absolutely. So, and we've all heard it, and I talk about it in the book, Nothing But the Dog in Me. We were raised hearing certain things that promoted that type of thinking within us. So when you ask me why I wrote the book, I, I remember when we were young and as kids, I used to hear this saying, and I'm pretty sure many in the viewing audience and listening audience have heard it before. When men got tired, we always said our dogs hurt. No, my dogs hurt or my dogs are tired. And you can verify yourself when you went into the military, one of the first things they gave you was a dog tag, Absolutely. A, a dog tag for identification. Yeah. So and I begin to think about that and I hear people say, well, you know, all men are dogs. So with that thinking, it had me consider, well, maybe I need to write about that because there are people who consider men, all men, dogs. Absolutely. And we know we've been brainwashed into. They, there's another little poem that we heard that uh, it was written in the 18th, 18th century. It was saying, you know what? Little girls are made of sugar and spice and all that is nice. And little boys are made of snaps and snails and puppy dogs tails. So we have been brainwashed into believing, boy, we're doggish. Whether we say it or not, that's why uh I was, I was reviewing and putting the book together, started to, the idea of putting the book together. That was part of the process of the thinking that we have been told and labeled as dogs. So it's easy for us to accept that mentality. And we accept it readily, just as you, when you went in the military, you didn't say, I don't want no dog tags. You got those dog tags. There's no choice. No choice. No, you get a dog tag. A dog is to identify you in case something seriously happens. Mm -hmm. um, that's your identification. So you're going to get that, and you're going to hold on to that. So, again, to answer your question, the reason I wrote the book is because of that mentality that has been uh, perpetrated with us, and we, it's, we, we have quickly as accepted it and adjust, adjusted our mentality that dogs, dogs, dogs. And, and I, I won't ever say it on the podcast, but, you know, when they said what these men call women, that derogatory term yeah. for dog. So one of the reasons I wrote the book, or one of the other reasons I wrote the book is because we need to explore that idea of what a dog is and what a dog isn't. So did I answer that question? Yeah, you did. Uh, the th the thing of it oh, is, a too, with a lot too. of women. Wait Show that book, will I, you? I need to, yeah. Let me go through here. This book here. Thank you, Mr. Voice from the Corner. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> this, this is the book. Uh, nothing, but, nothing But the Dog. Well, let me put it over here. There. Nothing But the Dog in Me. This is the book that you see the, the guy, you see the head on him is a dog. Yeah. And you see what he's doing. He's he's next to a fire hydrant. Dogs like to go on the fire hydrants. And they, that's called marking their territory. Most dogs do that. And this book we talk about, there's a chapter in the book called Marking His Territory. There's a chapter in here. And, and let me read them off to you because I really want you as a viewing and listening audience to pick up the book. Not because I wrote it, but because it has something informative within it. There's a chapter called Doggish. And we, you see a lot of guys who are doggish about women. Yeah. You know, I'm going to get that one. I'm going to get that one. So they're doggish. Then the, I have a chapter, Carol, marking his territory. Dogs tend to mark their, ter their territory for a number of reasons. They want other dogs to know, stay away from here. This is mine. This is mine. And loud barking. You know, you used to hear that saying, you know, dogs bark is worse than his bite. And there are some guys who are loud and they seem domineering. And then they're really pushovers. And the dog's out. Sometimes the dogs get loose, and the owners have to go out and find that dog and bring the dog back. He doesn't bite. I don't know. I've heard that a thousand times. My dog doesn't bite. My dog doesn't bite. If he has teeth, he, bites. he can bite. Yep. And so what we're talking about is some guys out there have that doggish mentality that they don't mind hurting somebody else in order to supposedly protect their property. Train, not tame. Some women out there, and I'm going to talk to some women. You need to get the book, too, because there's some of you as women think you can tame a guy. You think you can train him because you hear that. Hey, only a good man is a man who, you, you, you know, you got to tame your man. You got to train your man to do what he has to do. Well, this book is saying you can't do that. 
Because a guy will pretend to you to be whatever you want him to be till he gets what he wants from you. So you are not taming him. Any animal, so-called trained, will bite you when it feels uh, afraid. A tail chasing. I don't need to explain that. When you guys, when you get the book, you read that chapter called Tail Chasing, you know exactly yeah. what it's all about. Yeah. And you know, bringing home strays. What do we mean when we talk about bringing home strays? There's some women out here who believe that if they mother a guy, if they smother him, he won't do anything to them. Because you know what? I got him. I got him. He won't, he won't hurt me because he, he supposedly loves me. You bringing home a stray believes that you can bring him home and clean him up and fix him up and think you're going to change him. That's not going to happen. Let me, let me interject something Go right, right there. Because personalities are formed when you're six, seven, and eight. You're going to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And women feel that, you know, if I, if I expose him, he will change. No, not necessarily. He can learn some things, but that personality is formed. And I love what you just said because you said personality. Those personality traits and characteristics are in, inside him. And the only thing they look for is a triggering mechanism. And we talk about it in the book, the triggering mechanism. What that might be is different from, for every person. But dogs are like anybody. They're territorial. They want to know how far they can go, how far they can push you. And we talk also in the book about that alpha male syndrome, you know, that leading dog, the dog who has to lead the pack. If you read the book, because we're not going to have a lot of time to go over this book in entirety, but if you read the book, if you get the book, you'll be surprised at what it's talking about. And some of the things that you maybe you heard before, but I try to present it in a different uh, form for you. So it is more palatable, if you will, but it does not make it any less true. Yeah. So before we leave off to one component there, the first component to inform, I want the audience to be able to shoe, see these books right here in the ring with heels on. Mm -hmm. This book's about domestic violence against women. Yes. And one of the things here is the first signature, four signature books that we have. Uh, one thing I'm going to say that Tim lived this. And there's a reason behind him writing this book is because a family member asked him to help her girlfriend. She was in an abusive situation. Mm -hmm. So he had an opportunity to counsel him counsel her a few times, but unfortunately, the young lady was killed or murdered by him. Correct. And, and that's why we said in the ring with the heels on, uh, if you look at the book, and I said to the viewing audience, when you open up the book, it's 15 chapters, and you see on the cover, there's a, some high heels. As you said, Art, before, you really didn't pay attention to the heels, but you saw the gloves. Or you, some will see the gloves first, and some will see the heels sure. first. And the reason it's red is because it's dealing with violence. It's in the ring with the heels on. And men tend to want to monopolize and dominate the women. And that's what this book is talking about. It's 15 chapters representing 15 rounds of a fight. Yeah. You start off with the hype. Because every hype, every fight is hype. Muhammad Ali, before he got in the ring, everybody was hyping up the fight. You got to get, he's, he's this, he's that, he's the other. The hype is that introduction to, we hype up men and we hype up women. Women will hype up a man and say, you know, he's a good guy. He's not so bad, blah, blah, blah. So she will get into that position of deceiving herself about the relationship that she's about to get into. And the young lady that I referred to in the book was murdered because she believed that hype. She wanted to follow this guy, believing that she could train him, that she can tame him. He was going to be all right. But ultimately, he murders her. And as, as you mentioned, this was something that happened within my family to some a family member. So I know that it does happen. And what they have to look at, we start with the hype. And at, at the end of all fights, they always say the same thing. If the fight goes to four, 15 rounds or 12 rounds for the amateur fights, he would simply say what? The winner is in a domestic violence scenario. There is no winner. They're all losers because if like the young lady, she was murdered. The guy is in prison the rest of his life. And the young lady who is a uh, survivor, I know she lives with it every year that her best friend was murdered. 
So there comes a time that we need to stand up and make a decision for our own lives. In the ring with heels on is simply saying, in the ring with heels on is saying to us, you need to change. You need to change. You need to change now. What do I need to change? You need to change how you perceive yourself. What most women fall into is that I have low self-esteem. And because you have low self-esteem, any man could come along and so-called stroke you. You feel good about yourself. Absolutely. And what he's looking for is that opportunity to reel you in and make you his property, not his girlfriend. And this, in, in, this, in the ring with heels on, we talk about red flag moments. There are a lot of red flag moments that women you will see, but oftentimes you tend to shoo it away because you believe that I can make a difference with this person's life. I can't make a difference with that person's life unless you get involved. And I'm not telling you just because I wrote the book, this is because the information can make a difference in your life. And what is the, 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 we the first about? topic we're talking about is to inform. Exactly. And that's exactly what that book is about. Now we're going to move on to she's the boss. Very interesting title right here. She's the boss. This is domestic violence that women go towards men. Uh, it's a subject that individuals don't want to talk about, particularly men. But there are men out here who are getting physically beat and also mentally whipped. Mm -hmm. uh, so this book right here brings this out. A lot of people say, oh, no, but yes, it is. There is, it's a shame, and again, the impetus for why I wrote that book on the heels of In the Ring with, uh, in, in the ring with Heels On, it was incomplete because we hear a lot about women who are being abused all the time, all the time. Statistically, there says one in, in every nine seconds a woman is being abused. Now, when you held up this book, now here's the scary statistic I want you guys to know if you get, when you get the book. Just as many men are being abused as women. But the difference is this. It's not reporting. They don't talk about it. They don't talk men about will it. not talk about being abused. They will not talk about being beat. Especially when you are 6'5 and your girlfriend is 4'11 or 5 feet tall and she's coming in kicking you and battering you and beating you and hitting you and, and scratching you. And you go out and your friends see you. You don't want them to know that you're at home being beat by your wife. And in this book, I document a story of a military man. This guy was in the military and he was being abused by his wife. And he went and he tried to convey that message. And everybody told him, suck it up, man. There's no way that that woman is beating you. He was being beat regularly. But what he ended up doing, he tried again to communicate that message. No one listened to him. Ultimately, sadly, the man committed suicide. Yeah. When he committed suicide and they saw his body, the autopsy, uh, doing the autopsy and found his body, they found bruises and wounds all over his body that then they believed him that he was being abused. But I'm saying this to the audience again. I want you to understand clearly what we're saying. And I guarantee you, there are going to be women watch this podcast and say, no man is being beat as much as women. Women are being beat all the time. Sadly, if you look up the statistics, you're going to find that men are being beat too. And again, as hard as you would mention, men aren't going to talk about it. No. Because men, we, we got that ego. We don't want people to know I'm being beat by my little woman at home who's coming in and kicking you with steel toe boots or, or slapping you and uh, walking away and threatening you to say, hey, if you put your hands on me, I'm going to call the police. And in this book, again, I talk about it. 99.9 tenths of the time, if it's a domestic argument going on in the house, when the police come, they always have arrested the man. Now they're adjusting that that thinking, but before it was always the man. And we document the cases in this book where men have called the police on their wives and the police still arrested the man. Now, the other one here that we want to talk about briefly is choosing a mate over your child. Are you going to skip over this one? This is so prevalent is that uh, an individual will choose is that I have to have someone in my life. But what kind of individual are you bringing in your life? And also, if you have kids here, yeah. 
that is a situation that's so prevalent also because I need and I want to have someone who cares about me. Well, you know, the problem with that is, too, unfortunately, there are women out here. And again, I don't want women to think I'm beating up on them. There are women who are living their lives vicariously they want men to define who they are you women ladies you don't need a man to define you you don't need a a man to say who you are and now everybody remember the story of susan smith susan smith when she killed her children she had them in the car and she put the ran the car in the lake and her children died and she blamed the black man for killing her children and the reason she did that is because she wanted a specific man who said that he he wanted her but he didn't want her children. Yeah. And because he didn't want her children, she killed her own children. That's one of the reasons I wrote this book, Choosing a Mate Over Your Child. The danger of women who are putting men before their children. Ladies, there is no man on the planet more important than your children. I say that again. There's no man on the planet more important than your children. You should be giving your time to your children. If a man comes into your children's life, don't call him a good man. Say he's a decent man because you need to watch and listen and learn. If you're going to bring a, a, a man in your children's lives, you need to know about that man. And here's the other thing that we don't do. Women as well as men. Why aren't you investigating that person that you call yourself going to get into a relationship with? That's what I was going to speak about. Go and see how he treats his mother, how he treats women in his family. That will give you an idea that you may have to get out of that relationship early on because he's telling you something and you should be able to see that also. Now, with just what you said, they can see it. But some people have, some women have uh, that men's mindset. Again, please, ladies, I don't go send me no dirt, mean, nasty letters and say, well, you really beating up on the ladies today. No, I'm simply saying God made you last, but he didn't make you least. You are vital. You are important. Now, I'm saying how valuable you are, but it doesn't hold water unless you believe that you have that value. Absolutely. Because there are guys who want to devalue you. They're, they're looking for that opportunity. And because of that, there are some women out there who will follow a man to hell, if you will, rather than let him alone. Because she calls that love. Love is not going to have you beating your child because this man don't like your child. When that takes place, there's something wrong, not only with that picture, but something's wrong with your mentality as a lady, as a woman, as a mother, to allow some man to beat on your child, to beat your child up, and you will defend the man rather than love the child. Well said. To inform, that's the first category Mm -hmm. we talk about. Now we're getting ready to move on to educate. These books here are to educate individuals. Uh, And the first one is victim of bullies. Uh, Are you a bully or have you been bullied? Have this been in your life here? Individuals right here is that you'd be so surprised. And once you go and get this book in your hand, you will definitely see at least nine or ten different individuals who will surprise you that are bullies. And it starts off with mom and dad. It has clergy in there. It has teachers in there. And one of the biggest ones is there is multimedia internet and what it does to individuals. Uh, In this book, Tim has taken individuals from about the age of 12 or 15 and told their stories about bullying And unfortunately, some of them have taken their lives Mm -hmm. because of being bullied. And it's dear that to them. So this book right here is to educate. And along with the other ones, I'm going to say the Black Holocaust. Before we go further uh, with this Victim of Bullies book, again, get the books, read them. Not because I'm the author of the book or the writer of the book. Get the book for the information that they have in them. And I'm, I'm going to refer to, back to this book only for a moment uh, because last week, last week I had an opportunity to speak with some folks. And as I spoke with the folks at, at uh, Fairhill, 
center. Youth. Yes, some youth and, and the grandmothers and some parents. What we found happened while we were there, it was a young man had an opportunity to come up and speak. And he pulled at my heart so much, he had read the book. His grandmother got the book, and he read the book. And he, she asked him, do you want to share something with everybody? And he said, yes. He went up and he told him, he said, I read Mr. White's book. And he said, I was bullied. He was 15 years old. He was bullied from the third grade up to the time he was 15. Now, here's the sad part. He said it to everyone in the room. He said, after I read, I read the book, I learned some things about it, but he said, I was suicidal. 15 year old now. He was 15 suicidal and tried to kill himself at 15. What will drive a young child 15 years old or he was a little younger to want to harm himself? He re referred to a part of this book because there's a chapter in this book is I did. I, I, I don't want to live anymore. Yeah. He wanted to kill himself. So he felt his life was worth nothing. And just as you mentioned it already, Art, the culprits, we don't look at our children as being precious cargo. This young man, he is an imitator because he wasn't an originator. He was imitating what? He was being beat. He was being hurt. He was being threatened. He was being pushed around, knocked around. He internalized that. And one young man even said that. I said, who do you talk about bullying to? He said, I don't tell anybody. He said, I hold it inside. What sense does it make to have a child holding that kind of hurt inside when there's help available? We need to get the help for these young men and young ladies when it's available to them before they go and hurt themselves. Now, with that being said, I want to also say with this victim of bullies book, I did also this workbook. I'm showing you a workbook here. This workbook it was not done for the children. It's for educators. It's for educators. Okay. Why? Why was this book done for educators? The major reason that we did this book for the educators is because some of the educators, and you mentioned it too, the educators are adults. Who is better qualified to be a bully than an adult? And with that, this book, the first thing I ask in this book, in the first chapter of the book, is I ask the educators the question, are you a bully? Bear in mind, when a child comes home, or maybe at home, he's at home with abusive parents, be it the father or the mother, one of them abusing him, maybe both of them abusing him. Then he has siblings, and the siblings are abusing him. Yeah. So he's getting beat by mom, beat by dad, beat up by his own siblings, go in the street and he's getting bullied and mess around, get to school, he's being bullied. Now he's at school, he's looking for help. Who does he go to to get that help if everybody in his circle are bullies, including the teacher? For instance, we had an incident where a young man falling asleep at the table, and he was yelled at, pick up his head, get his head off the table. That person didn't realize that boy was being abused. Maybe the only sleep he was getting was when he was in that classroom. I know it's wrong, but he, he was, that was the only solace he had. But then he was threatened, he was screamed at and told what to do. Did anyone investigate the problem that he was going through? Did anyone investigate and make sure that they weren't a bully and that he wasn't being bullied? I know parents, I know adults out there, you feel that, hey, that's not my child, it's not my, you know, my uh, worry. Yes, it is. Because if that child becomes a bully, maybe he's going to go out and buy a gun or a knife and come back to school and kill somebody. We've seen it happen, and we talk about it in the workbook as, as well as the book. As you believe, brought the book up, on page 31, a victim of bullies. It gives you a short list of potential bullies. And listen to this. Potential bullies are dad, mom, siblings, which you have said, mm -hmm. teachers, students, coaches, adults, police, judges, and attorneys. Also bosses. But as I said early on, one of the biggest culprits is social media and internet, which everybody has in front of them. So that gives you an idea. Go to Amazon.com and pick up this book, Victim of Bullies. This is a source that you really need. Thank you. No problem. And also with that, there is a DVD that we have created for that. It's a PowerPoint presentation that we want as we were in the school system. Uh, we're teaching it at, before the COVID virus hits. 
I recommend that every educator, all schools get the book, the workbook and the DVD and go over that. Go over the DVD and the workbook before you even talk to any children about bullying because you may find out, number one, you have no business teaching it. One thing I'd like to interject is that our book is in uh, the Cleveland Municipal School District. Yes. Uh, and it has all three of those entities in there. So what you can do is that you can get with your educators and get this book in hand. This particular package right here is so valuable with that, along with the book, along with, with the educated book and the DVD. So to highlight real quick, there are some books we want you in their package, not package deal, but I, I say they belong in the package. In the Ring with Heels On, Domestic Violence Against Women. She's the Boss, Domestic Violence Against Men. Victim of Bullies is Domestic Violence and How It Affects Our Children. Well, let me hold them up real quick again so you'll see each one of them again. And they all tie into one another. In the Ring with Heels On, Domestic Violence Against Women. Then we had She's the Boss. Is domestic violence against men. Then we had victim of bullies, how domestic violence affect our children. Then we also have choosing a mate over your child, how women make the wrong decisions, and yet you can change that. It's a simple matter to change it. It's not as complicated as you might think. And then the last one in that group right now is nothing but the dog in me. You can, you can dress a snake up. You can dress a pig up, but you know what? You don't change the nature of that snake or the nature of that pig. It's still going to do what it does. Now, where we get, we should get smarter is that we've learned by watching others. Don't let other people's mistakes be your mistake. And with that in education, I want to keep going and their victim bullies is what we have in the educational area. Uh, also, too, with that, it's Black Holocaust. And our latest, one of our latest books out, Lynching, A Rope No Longer Required. Those are the books that we have in the educational component. And one of the things I want briefly you speak on, ropes no longer required, lynching. Well, I, what you mentioned both of them. I'm going to let people know the brother and sister books. And the one, first one you just mentioned was here. It's The Black Holocaust. Now, the Black Holocaust, I wrote it some years ago, a few years back. But this book has, I've had it out for a number of years. And the black history professor at John Carroll University was using this book to help uh, teach some black history. Now, this book documents everything that happened from 1619 when we first came over, all at 1654 when we became slaves, and all the way from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement. It's all contained in this book. There's some pictures in here that are not good for children to see because it's dealing with the lynchings and so forth. But I recommend that people get the book and read it. And if you notice, it says the Black Holocaust. And I want to give you something that I was told some years ago about that word Holocaust. When I had the black, black Holocaust, I had a Jewish guy say, why am I using that word Holocaust? I said, what do you mean, why am I using the word Holocaust? He said, no, the word Holocaust. I said, what about it? I said, uh, I have the right to use that. He said, no, no, no. I, and I had to let him know. I said, what do you mean? Oh, I know what you mean. You mean Auschwitz and Dachau, where the Jewish people were killed by Hitler in the concentration camps. Yes. He said that. I said, okay, but I want you to understand something about that word Holocaust. That word Holocaust comes from a Swahili word, and it's a chapter in the book called Ma'afa. It came from a Swahili word, Ma'afa, which is genocide or Holocaust. And I said, if you look at what Hitler did to the Jewish people, it was done long before that to black people who were enslaved. Yes, so I told him, and he couldn't answer the question. I said, so why can't I use the word Holocaust? He didn't say anything more because he realized that if you, and this is what I wanted you to understand, audience, learn to read, because when you read, it takes ignorance away. And we remain ignorant as long as we don't know what we're talking about. See, I could defend, if I had to, why I wrote the book, but I didn't need to. But because of his ignorance, it became necessary for me to share with him why, the why. And that's what we oftentimes are missing is the why with that. And you mentioned the fact that we have the latest book. This one just come out. It's called Lynching, Lynching. Rope No Longer oh, Required. Right. Now, this particular book, this particular book, I wrote it, and it's doing really well in the market right now. Why was this book written? 
It was written because there's a need to educate us. Now, when we talked about this book before on the podcast, we talked about 170 families who were uh, murdered by police officers. But then I talked about 11,000, over 11,000 black men, women, children who were killed also. And those black men, women, and children, over 11,000, we don't talk about those killings. Why? Those were black-on-black crimes. So is it bad for white cops to kill black people? And it's not bad for black people to kill black people. Yes, sir. We need to look that and re-examine that. Yes, this book is talking about it and it's enumerating what happened innocently walking by black, going to the store while black, banking while black, sitting in the car sleeping while black, in the college dorm sleeping while black. These, these things are happening. But here again, most of us don't want to research. Now, here's something I want you to understand, audience. If you don't like to research, Cool. If you're lazy, cool, but it's not. But if you are, I took the guesswork out. Here's the book that enumerates things for you. All you have to do is read it. If you don't like reading, buy the book, give it to somebody who does. They'll come back and tell you, you need to learn to read. Excellent. Good thing right there. So that's the second one. Recap. The book is Inform. This piece right here is Education. And we move to the third one right now, and that's personal growth. Personal growth, uh, really, this is one of my favorites right here. Uh, seven signs of success. <laughs> I wonder why. Yeah, seven signs of success. This book here not only helps you as far as personal growth, but it also can help you as far as business is concerned. Um, and I love both of them right there. Uh, there again, seven signs of success. The secrets out. Yes, the secrets out. And one of the things that you have, not only on the front, but it also shows you the signs on the back, back here. Here are the seven signs that you look at. And when I read this book, uh, doing a charity that Tim had given to me when it first came out. Now, before you go further, I want the audience to know about why you got that book. Because I was talking about, I did a seminar, it was a young man in a seminar who wanted his mother to get the book. And the mom finally bought the book and took it home. And the young man read the book. He read the book and his mother called me and said, I hate you. I'm saying, what do you mean? She said, I hate you. And then she started laughing. She said, no, I don't hate you. But my son brought the book home and he wouldn't put the book down. He read the book and read the book and talked about every time we went down the street, mom, there's a sign. Mom, you can be successful. There's another sign. And I was talking about that in the car with Art and Otis. And then he said, do you have a copy of that book? I said, I think I do have a copy of it. Let me go in there and get it. And I went in the house, got the copy of the book, gave it to Art, and that's where Art can pick that up because this is his story. Yeah, I'm sitting on the porch on a Saturday afternoon, beautiful day, and... Being a part of two Fortune 500 companies, when you get a sales book or a promotional book from a Procter & Gamble or Cheeseboro Ponds or Unbelievers, the book is about 450 pages. You're not going to read that many. So when I picked up this book here and read this book in the afternoon, there are 125 pages in here that hit right home Versus the 450. You're not going to read this. You're going to read 125 pages. And what you get out of this right here is that what you may be holding you back to be successful internally, this book helps you externally, externally bring that out. And that's so important because so many of us are held back because what we have inside mm -hmm. of us is keeping us back. Mm -hmm. You got to let that go. You got to let that go and get the positive energy, and that's how you become successful as a person and as a business person. Also, this is a guy. This is a guy that puts in front of you that you'll be able to have your own successful story. Identify negative words such as "I can't," "I'll try," and "I might." How many times have you said that? You have to get those negative mm -hmm. things outside of you. 
and get the positive things right there because that's how you grow with positive things. Too many times we hold on to that. Too many times we hold on to the wrong people who are mm-hmm. negative. Mm-hmm. So you have to get with positive people who are doing positive things. That's how you grow in life. That's the incentive in life right there. So there again, I'm just giving you some excerpts from Seven Signs of Success. The Secret is Out. This book is fantastic. Uh, Individually and also business-wise. You need to have a copy of this book right here because you're going to see the signs all over the place, just as he spoke earlier about the young man. Uh, When I got through reading this book, I'm sitting on the porch and I look to the right. What's the first thing I see? Great big stop sign. I had to start laughing. I said, wow. I left out about a couple hours later and went through a construction area. Yield. There are bumps in the road. There's all those things right here we talk about in Seven Signs of Success. I tell you, go to Amazon.com, Tim White Publishing, Senior, and get this book. You know, I say that, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. I, I wrote my little hook phrase to this book was, this is the biggest little success book you'll ever read. And you were talking about five, 600 pages. This is condensed. Again, the information what is the model that we stand by? Uh, my formula, my life formula is I plus A equals T. Mm-hmm. That I plus A equals T, which means information plus application, application equals transformation. transformation. So it happens. See, these guys saying it in the back, if you guys can hear them, they know it because that's our model, part of our, our model with Tim White Publishing. Information plus application equals transformation. What good is information if you never apply it? If you don't apply it, it's not going to change anything about yourself. And I always say you can reverse it too. My transformation, my transformation is due to the application of the information I've acquired. So the seven signs of success is just a simple little book that simply say, hey, you can be successful. And it tells you how to do it. And it, I talk about it in the book. I'm saying, hey, the secret to success is number one, there's no secret. We, you know, you guys out there paying thousands and thousands of dollars to get books and, and, and workbooks and so forth and say, hey, I'm going to learn to be successful because somebody's writing a book and say, hey, I'm going to tell you marketing secrets. I'm going to tell you how to get this secret to it, but it's only going to cost you $2,000 to get that secret. And they'll go pay for that secret and find out, eh, hey, well, wasn't that much of a secret after all. I already knew some of these things. Because people are opportunists. This book is simply saying you can be successful right here, right now, and it doesn't cost you a lot of money to do that. You have to begin with who you are. Absolutely. Oh, let's quickly. Because with this book, I know you you remember, but with this book, I'm also doing a a course with this book, a three-part course. That three-part course is workbooks. So when you get this, even if you are a business owner and you feel that you've already accomplished everything in life, the three part book uh, course is I have the PAM course It's called P.A.M. The PAM course. There's a preparation course. Then there's an application course. And then there's a mastery course. And in the future, we'll explain that a little bit more. So we'll move on. So let's recap. There are three things we've talked about so far to inform as far as the books are concerned to educate, and to personal growth with seven signs of success. The secret is out. Get the secret. Mm -hmm. And the next area that we're going into is the fourth area right here, spirituality, that we're going to be talking about uh, with some of the books are so prevalent. Uh, When a loved one dies, evangelism one-on-one, a pulpit pimps. Oh, the books were open. The Lord's Prayer, the Fearful Giver, Gospel and the Sword, the Truth was revealed in the Upper Room, How to Build the Body of Christ, and 12 Principles of Spiritual Surrendering. This book right here that I have in front of you right here, 12 Books of Surrendering. This is a copy that you need to get right here. There again on Amazon.com, we have eight commercial books and we have 12 spiritual books with two more coming. Mm-hmm. I want you to take a look at it. 
we give you a different flavor here as far as communication concern and books. So we're moving into what I would call Tim's expertise, spirituality. Uh, what are we talking about here in some of the books right here? Uh, yeah. Do we spiritual surrendering? Yeah, 12 principles of spiritually surrendering. All the time you hear Christians saying, you know what, I'm obedient to the Lord, and I know the Lord, I, I, I surrender all. You know, that's a good song, I Surrender All. And I refer to the song in the book as well. I Surrender All, but did you surrender? And most of us, the answer is going to be no. We have not really surrendered to the Lord. When we surrender to the Lord, that means no matter what happens, God, you are the one in charge of my life, in control of my life, my purpose, my destiny, my eternity. It's all in the Lord's hand. Now, in order to surrender, you're going to have to go through some things. And that's what this book talks about. It's talking about how to get through those things in life that cause complication with us. God knows what we can endure. The Bible makes it clear. God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He will not. But it's up to us. We have a part to play in all of this. And that's what we're going to be talking about. The remainder of the podcast today is the, the spiritual side. God is holding us accountable. It does no good to bring this information in and you don't do anything with it. Absolutely. So part of that is how do I make the adjustments in my life? Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. So it, it's a part that you and I must do that God holds us accountable for. God knows what he can do and will do. But will you do the part that he's given you to do? So that's one of the reasons I wrote. 12 principles of spiritually surrendering. There are 12 little things that are complicated because we allow our flesh to envelop us and to lead us rather than allow the Holy Spirit who was sent by God to direct us. Can you speak on the 12 there uh, or some of them as far as the 12? Are well, in the book, we start off with suffering because many of us don't like suffering. I don't think, I don't know too many people who say I look forward to suffering, but Part of who we are in our growth, we have to go through some suffering. We have to go through some things. We have to lose some things. And because of that loss, many of us don't know what to do. So the book is saying, hey, hey you're suffering some things. After you suffer, you have to learn to understand what it is and why you went through that. Then there's a reformation part to reform us from inside, to reform us. And then we talk about the restoration because you've been reformed. Now you have to be restored. When God allows us to be broken, he also shows us ways that we can be built up again. Absolutely. So this is part of it. Part of the 12 principles are, is understanding when you look at the book and when you look at the chapters, there are always questions that we need to ask ourselves as we're developing into the people that God has called us to be. And I had some people compare this to the 12 step program. And I said, yeah, there are 12 steps to this as well. But they're totally spiritual. We're not looking at, okay, emotionally or morally. We're looking at spiritual surrender. Would you, would you say that book is part of a breakdown to build up? Yes, because you have to be broken. And that's why we started with suffering in the chapter. The first chapter is suffering and the last chapter is growing. If you go through the suffering aspect, knowing you've been broken down, beat down, hurt, deserted, abandoned, whatever, you know, all the, the emotions that we go through. Then there comes a time God is fixing you. And when you get to that part of understanding that not only am I being fixed, but I'm growing through that. The Bible tells us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as I am being broken, I'm also being fixed. Okay, well said. Well said. Uh, we have another one over there to want to take a look at. Which one is it going to be there? You had Evangelism 101, as you mentioned after that. So Evangelism 101. This, I, I've, this is one of my pet books, too. Somebody asked me which was my favorite book. I don't have a favorite one, but some of my pets. Evangelism 101. I wrote this book, and we're going to have a guy on in October. He's read many of these books, and he's going to come on and talk about the books and how they've changed his life. But evangelism one-on-one, -on -one, we all know evangelism. We all heard about evangelism. And most people feel that I'm not qualified to be an evangelist. I don't even know what an evangelist is. Well, we complicate things that God has made simple. This book, it says evangelism one-on-one, -on -one, winning the world back to God 
or back to Christ one soul at a time. In this book, I show with you, I share with you many ways that you can go out and evangelize without evangelism. You don't always have to have a cross hanging around your neck or a Bible under your arm or something to say here, a neon sign lighting up and say, I'm a Christian. Christian. But there are ways we can do certain things that bring, get people's attention and then we can teach them. That goes back to what you're saying, spirituality. We talked about inf- informing, then educate, and personal growth. That This is a part of it. After those things, you should be, become spiritually sound in your faith. And this will teach anyone who don't know how to evangelize that you can be an evangelist. You don't have to wear a title, say evangelist, but we all should be evangelizing. It's the fact that individual doesn't have to uh, parade and stay on the corner and pray is that mm-hmm. you'll find out that you know a Christian if he doesn't say anything but just the way he carries himself. Well, what you just said is a quote of Matthew five sixteen without even saying it. it. Said, "Let your light so shine before men that they see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven." So if we, if the light is on, people are going to see it. Yeah, and that's what evangelism is. Evangelism to me is. You going out and sharing with people the light that you have. You don't have to say, hey, I'm a 60-watt bulb or a 100-watt bulb. They're going to see it anyway. Absolutely. People know a 40-watt bulb from a 100-watt bulb just by turning the light on. Uh, and that's what they're looking for, and that's what evangelism one-on-one is all about, is to say, hey, let's keep it simple. God, Christ came to make everything simple. We get in the way and try to complicate it. The reason we complicate it, because we want people to follow us and not follow the Lord. Yeah. That's so true. Now you want, want to, uh, you want to keep going now for these? I want you books? to get another book. Okay, here, then we, we'll time. do this. I don't know if we're gonna get all these books in today either. No, not, not all of them today. But here is one. <laughs> I, I'm holding up. Excuse me. Why did I know you were gonna pick that up? I don't know. Why did you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Pulpit pimps and their power to deceive. Man, you know, if you read this book, I'm gonna tell you something. Some years ago, I was at a, a conference and I had some of the books on the table like we have on the table now. This book was the only book nobody picked up. They left it. They, they put it under every other book. And I'm talking about Christians and ministers didn't pick up the book. And at first I was wondering, what, why, why aren't they picking this book up? They maybe thought it was talking about them. I'm talking about those people who are out there standing in the pulpits every Sunday and lying to the congregation. I don't name names, but I, there's some people in it, like there's David Koresh is in the book, talking about him and, and what he did in Waco, Texas, and Jim Jones, what he did in Guyana, Africa, how there are people who are leading other people away from the Lord so they can have mass followings for themselves. So we have to understand, they are literally pulpit pimps. They are pimps in the pulpits, and somebody said they're prostitutes in the congregation. Hmm. So the pimps in the pulpit and prostitutes in the congregation. What does that say to us? That means we're not living the way we're supposed to be living. We're not teaching what we should be teaching. The word of God is not always going to make us feel good. And I know this book is not going to make some people feel good. And, and with that being said, if you're not going to make you feel good, so let me go to the, another book. This one then, The Gospel and the Sword. The Gospel and the Sword, really, those who know the gospel, those who know the word of God, I take a portion of that from Ephesians chapter six, put on the whole arm of God. And I break down the arm of God, what the arm of God is, how we should put it on and what we should look like while we're wearing it. And Matthew 10, 34, Jesus said, think not that I'm going to come send peace on the earth, not peace, but a sword. So here, that's what this gospel and the sword is. The gospel will cut us to ribbons. The word of God will cut us into fine little pieces. Because we are trying to do things that God said not to do our way and not doing it God's way. When we take self out of the way and allow the Lord to lead us and to guide us, this book becomes practical. Are you dressed to serve? Do you have on the whole arm of God? Or you want those people to say, I know those shoes look good. You're going to put on the shoes. What's protecting your head? What's protecting your body? What's protecting your heart? Putting on the whole arm of God. That's what it said. The word of God is like a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. That's what the gospel and the sword will do. Beloveds, I want you to understand something. If you read any of these books, these books are not all about making you feel good till you first get diagnosed how bad you are. 
once you know how bad you are and accept the fact that you're messed up, God can clean you up. Absolutely. And in that, uh, we're going to recap again. But before we recap, the evil in me. I see it in front of you. Just please give a little recap on the that. The evil that's me? Yeah. You know what? This book originally, the evil that's me, five minutes. This yeah. book originally started out as uh, about five pages. It was called No Excuses, No Excuse. That's what it was originally called. But then when you read this book, you're going to find out, hey, you, we're rotten and vile people. You know, in this book, let me tell you what some of the chapters are. The evil that's me. Everybody pays for sex. I know some people want to get the book because it said that. Everybody pays for sex. Healing, not believing. I'm only human. The Holy Spirit. The tempter. The, temp the tribulation. War. AOL. And that's AOL. Remember back in the days we had America Online, right? Uh, AOL. Uh, but I took the acronym and said Angel of Light. So there's some pretenders out there dressed to kill, but they're angels of deception. In the crowd, hearing voices. The evil that's me, I know you originally said, uh, we shouldn't even market this book. We're not going to talk about this book. Why? So I don't do cult. You don't do cult. <laughs> yeah. Until you find out it wasn't about being a cult. Yeah. It was all about loving the Lord. Yes, we're being evil. We're evil. Yes. Folks, I hope you heard what R just said that. We are evil. We are evil. And some people are going to, I know I'm going to get some uh, remarks about that. I'm not evil. I'm a good man. Oh, we're all evil. Unfortunately, you need to accept that in order for the Lord to help you. Okay. So we only, we're only down to the last three minutes. Yeah. So, Art, what do you have to say real quick? And then we're going to we're, talk What we about want to say one. real quick is a recap. These are books are from Tim White Publishing Company. We went through the books to inform, to educate, personal growth, and spirituality. They're available for you. Amazon.com, Tim White Sr. is the author of the books. Go in, check them out, and I think you'll be quite happy to see what you're there. And then also leave a review. You, As Absolutely. the books come up, you can say, hey, I like this book very much. Or oh, I can't stand this guy. Or oh, I can't okay stand too. this guy. There it is. So I'll leave you and put it back in Tim to end of this. All right. Well, again, we, we consider it a privilege and a blessing to be here. And we just want you to know a little bit about what we do. And with that, before we close out, there's a couple books coming out in the next few weeks again from us. One, I don't have the flyer for it right now in my hand, but that one is called In the Garden with Jesus. And it's talking about everything that happened to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the last one is this book is coming out sometime in October. That's my goal to have it in October. It's called Jim Crow in the Church. Now that... People were waiting for Jim Crow and the church is all about the racism that is found in our local congregations. And I know some people aren't going to like it, but the truth is the truth. It's talking about racism in the church. So, again, we thank everybody for tuning in. We're hoping that something said or done will bring you a blessing or you become a blessing out there in the real world. I want to thank Art Finley for being here. He again he is our sales and marketing manager. Otis Walker, you can say hello from back there. Hey, everybody. Yeah. So people know who you are. And until next week, we'll see you then for Unlocking the Power of You. Mm -hmm.